Yeah, it's a question. What's going on with Russia anyway? How come it's failing in Ukraine? And what is going on with Putin? What is in his mind? So we don't know for sure, but we can certainly speculate. Uh, and uh, Carl Ackerman joins me for this discussion on History is Here to Help. Welcome to the show, Carl. Thank you, Jay. Always a pleasure. So we have a whole bunch of things that have happened in the recent past. You know, starting maybe three weeks ago, we saw all these articles and all these newspapers, and we heard all this news about how, um, you know, the, the Russians were losing in eastern Ukraine. And uh, that was interesting. And, I, you know, I, I chalked it up myself to American weapons and maybe American, you know, uh, advice and counsel. Um, but it's more than that. It's, it's the whole Ukrainian army. It's the way they, you know, they come together, their collaborative thinking together and, and their determination to protect their country. At the same time, it also seems that Putin is, um, has overshot himself. He's, um, he's, he's uh, out of his comfort zone. He can't get people to go along with him. Uh, he can't get the troops motivated. Um, he can't. He can't win. And at some level, his his army has like given up. Uh, and and here we are. And of course, this troubles him very greatly. He's a kind of a guy who's when he's cornered, like any good psychopath, when he's cornered, he doubles down. He's been doing that all the while. And so I wanted to explore with you what all of this means. How strong really is the Ukrainian army? How strong is the EU? How strong is American and Joe Biden's support for the Ukrainians? Um, and of course, how strong is, is Putin? How strong is Russia? Uh, and, and, that, and that'll be the first six hours. And <laughs> after that, <laughs> why don't you, oh, oh and I wanna, I wanna add that I've, I've been watching um, your friend uh, Tim Snyder in his lectures on the uh, creation of Ukraine as a country. And it's very interesting, you know? I mean, originally it was the Vikings, for God's sake. It was the Vikings. And, 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 and Valdemir was the Viking hero. And, and that's where Vladimir and Volodymyr come from. Uh, it's so interesting, you know, that you wouldn't have expected that at all. So it's, it's, it's got a rich history for sure, rich and, 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 and basically unhappy. Um, lots of pogroms, lots of anti-Semitism, lots of killing uh, in the war. But here we are with a, an apparently democratic country, which seems to have its act together, which seems to have the support of Europe and the US as against a country that is um, you know, a, a pariah, to use the term that's so often used. Uh, so let's let's look at at at, at uh, Putin first. Where is he on the continuum? Does he have any real leg to stand on here, historically and sociologically? Um, historically, no. Um, you know the the original Rus or the original um, Russian state, as it were, was really a, a Kievan state. So and. You know, it looked like, um, you know, if you were around around 800 um, uh, in, in the common era um, or, you know, A.D., as people sometimes say, um, you would know that Kiev was a, you know, bustling economic entity, you know, trading with uh, Byzantium, you know, the second Rome. And, uh, you know, so, you know, historically, we'd be, we, um, Jay, you and I have discussed this, historically, really, um, the Ukrainian state occurred before the Russian state. And it was only because the Mongols coming in in 1240 that decimated Kiev and people started migrating northward. And you were absolutely right. The Vikings um, came down and they, you know, had names like Ryrick and Oleg and things like that and established themselves, you know, sometime in the seventh and eighth centuries. And then um, under uh, Prince Vladimir, they adopted both, you know, the Greek Orthodox Church and um, which later became the Russian Church and, of course, the Cyrillic script, which has driven every Russian student crazy, at least for the first month, because, you know, if you take a word like pectopa, P-E-C-T-O-P-A-H, you soon realize that Russian letters uh, look very similar to um, 
sort of the Western Latinized uh, letters, but Pectopon Russian is restaurant. So, you know, their P, you know, the, the, you know, RP is their R, et cetera, et cetera. RH is their N. So, you know, things become very confused. But anyway, so there's no historical leg to st uh, stand on. And as you and I have discussed, Vladimir Putin is a great, uh, he follows in the tradition of a great 19th century Slavophile. He believes in a greater Russia. Um, he was, you know, heartbroken when the um, Soviet Union fell um, in 1991. And he, remember in 1989, he was in that East German embassy, you know, destroying documents. So, you know, this is a guy who only can be described as President Macron um, described on CNN um, earlier today as, you know, there's a psychological issue here. And um, Putin, Vladimir Putin really wants to, you know, take over the old Soviet empire. And Macron interestingly called it a colonial venture. And um, so, you know, I don't think there's any stopping him. The danger here is, as you mentioned at the beginning of our talk today, Jay, is that he is, you know, a form of psychopath in the sense that he's going to do whatever, whatever he wants to do. He's not going to listen to other folks. And he has, you know, one agenda, and the agenda is to take over the Ukraine. Um, does that mean that um, we may be um, looking at a, a pro, uh, perhaps a, a tactical nuclear strike? I think we're pretty close. Um, I think that, you know, if the demonstrations continue in Moscow, as they're doing, um, one must remember what happened during the Vietnam War when Richard Nixon was forced to capitulate because there were so many people in the United States that were against the Vietnam War. And uh, I mean, not that, you know, uh, Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger weren't trying to solve the issue as best they could, but there were a whole lot of people opposed to them. Unfortunately, in, um, in Russia today, those people who protest get put in jails and are treated horribly, but um, including, you know, women basketball players uh, who are accused falsely of doing things, but we won't go there. But the point is that Putin's in his last rope, and the the reason, and I'll stop after this statement. The reason for the J for the um, Ukrainian victories is not a difficult one to figure out. I mean, of course they're brave, and we're all Ukrainians, or anyone who is in support of democracy is Ukrainian. But you know, going back to the American Revolution, when you're on someone else's soil and you're the foreign invader, and all you want to do is take over, that's a bad position to be in. And unless you're willing to have, you know overwhelm people with superior uh, military might, and unless you're very organized. And, you know, the British Empire, which was in a much better position um, to put us down um, in the American Revolution, failed. And it's, 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 it's it, you, know, you know, every country that tries to do this eventually will fail. I mean, look what happened to the United States. I mean, we were trying to colonialize, but in Afghanistan and also the, so the former Soviet Union in Afghanistan. So Don't forget Vietnam. Vietnam. Yeah, and Vietnam was, you know, a, you know, a great example. And, you know, we weren't the first to do it. It was the French. We should have learned from the French and Dien Bien Phu, but we didn't. So, I mean, there comes, there comes a point where any rational leader would cut and run. And Russia, you know, pulled out of Afghanistan, and, you know, um, it, but it's not pulling out here. And he's doubling down and he's threatening nuclear weapons. And, uh, you know, I mean, anybody rational around him would say, uh, Vladimir, it's time. It's time to cut it. You know, find it. Find us a way out. Make a settlement. Who knows what? Just get out. Um, you know, putting three hundred thousand young Russians uh, in conscription and having them march into the maw and come back in body bags. And already eighty thousand young Russian boys have been killed. Um, you know, it's just it's not a good idea to continue that. He's got people who are very upset with him, including oligarchs from around him, including a lot of people who, who have left Russia in opposition to what he's doing. Is so when does he get the message? Is it never? Yeah, I don't I don't think that he, you know, I don't think he's truly a Democrat small D. Um, I don't think he's listening to anyone. And you know, one of the things that you and I have talked about is that, you know, with the old Politburo in place, you know, you had a whole bunch of other voices. You know, you had the party secretary like Mikhail Gorbachev, the last one, but you had a whole bunch of people who were counseling um, the party secretary and a whole bunch of people surrounding him. And so in this case, you know, I mean, 
Vladimir Putin is, is acting, you know, much like Stalin did or, you know, Vladimir Lenin, you know, that he's a, he's a ruthless totalitarian leader, but, um, you know, with the semblances of democracy and that he, he was elected. Will, will that prevail? Let, let me, let me uh, throw one factor on the screen for you. Here's a picture of a Russian soldier and you can see how young he is. You can see how unprepared he is for war. You, you can see the fear in him. Um, and you want to bring 300,000. I mean, this is a, this is a, f a few weeks, maybe a couple of months ago. Um, they're going to be younger now, the conscripts. Um, and I mean, it touches your heart even to see this kid uh, being thrown into a, a, a completely unnecessary violence, a violence without a benefit to anybody. Well, and so you know, we, we the people to... back at home in Russia, they know this kid. And this this is their kid. Uh, they're not going to they're not going to support him at all. It's a, it's a big factor. That's why you know thousands of people have gone into the streets to oppose him. Can he still pull it off? Well, that I, I don't think so. And I, I you know I, we we have a, a, a you know the Vietnam War uh, you know which you and I saw directly. Um, I may be older than you, Jay. So I <laughs> I faced it when I was eighteen and. Um, <laughs> You know, that was when the draft reoccurred and you were drafted on the basis of your number in a lottery system. There used to be for you know, the middle class and upper middle class a way to avoid it through student deferment, but that ended. And so depending on your when your number hit, mine hit in 72 and we were still fighting. Luckily, I had a high number and I didn't I wasn't drafted. I didn't have to go and fight and I probably would have been a nurse of some form. Uh, you know, I, I didn't want to kill people, but um, that's a whole nother issue. But um the, well, the question I, is I a think. sociological one and, and a political one. Will the people of Russia, who have been hammered with propaganda for the past couple months, past several months, um, you know, and who are afraid of their, uh, their leader, Putin, will they tolerate this or will they rise up? Well, there's still, you know, there's still mass media, um, you know, uttering propaganda the way, you know, um, people did in the United States and, you know, what under Henry Kissinger and Richard Nixon. Um, and so there's a message being thrown there. The difference, of course, in the United States is that we had many messages being given and many reporters who were, you know, becoming anti-war themselves after seeing what was going on and trying to present the war fairly, you know, and, you um, the Russians aren't getting that. And most people, most Russians, from what I've seen in my many trips there, have, um, you know, just adhere to what's on television and um, talk about it. But the, the problem is now that you're, you're having thousands of uh, men come back in body bags and you're having people leaving the country, um, both by plane and by car. And it's not that it's the entire country or the quote unquote silent majority that's doing this, but, you know, this affects people. Um, you know, and no matter what your propaganda says, if people are not being able to, you know, equate what's going on on state media with what they're seeing with their friends and their neighbors and their children, especially and grandchildren, then then that, that's a problem. And that, that picture that you had was so uh, reminiscent of the average age of the uh, Vietnam War um, veteran, I mean, fighting man being 19 years old. So we had a similar sort of situation. And it's, I don't see there's any kind of um, negotiation. Interestingly enough, um, uh, the French president um, was on uh, CNN today, and he was talking about his encounters with Vladimir Putin. And he just said, Macron said, look, um, the, you know, this is a psychological issue now. I mean, he was implying there's no more negotiation possible. It's very difficult. Um, and, and I think he's right on that. And then um, Anthony Blinken today, um, spoke at the United Nations. And I, I would say that that speech everyone should take a look at because it is the best indictment of Russia overall and what has been happening um, since February of this year um, that could have been summarized in a short period of time. He was really uh, quite eloquent and, um, and um, to the point. And, and, you know, if I may draw from one of our great um, American reporters and authors, I mean, Thomas Friedman was saying this a, a month or two ago that, you know, one of the one of the one of the outcomes that he did not want to see was you know Vladimir Putin Putin pushed into a corner, which he is now, and rightfully so, um, uh, because he feared the um, 
tactical use of nuclear weapons. Now, he's definitely in a corner. He's yeah, got people so, rioting in the streets. He's got the sanctions all over him. He's uh, everyone's calling him names and saying he's a pariah. His Europe, Europe is coming together more than he expected. The United States is uh, helping more than he expected. Uh, his his army is um, really not doing well. His supply lines aren't doing well. The outcomes for them aren't doing well. He is definitely in a corner. And if you say that he's he's a guy who runs it no matter what, then we have to ask the question: Will he? You know, I guess the first thing is I think he will conscript three hundred thousand young men. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess the question from that is: Will, will they make a difference? Because they're untrained, uh, they're draftees. Uh, they, you know, they they don't have necessarily they don't have the support or the equipment um, to do the job. I don't know where he's going to get that from. I don't know how he's going to train them. Uh, so that's my first question: uh, Will will the three hundred thousand conscripts actually change the calculus here? Um, no. That's the that's the quick answer. It's not going to change the calculus because you have a divided um, upper echelon uh, of the military. Um, and from what I have been hearing is um, and reading is that Vladimir Putin is trying to give you know advice <laughs> um, to his generals on the ground. And where have we seen this before? Um, Nicholas II did the same thing, and that outcome was revolution in Russia. So. Um, that's not a very good um, outcome. Oh, for... that, that leads to the most interesting question of the day. Uh, <laughs> Carl, is revolution possible now? Um, I, don't th- I don't think revolution, um, but I think regime change is possible. Um, I think that, you know, there may be people, you know, um, in the upper echelons of Russia that say, hey, this guy's got to go and somehow... Um, remove them. I think it's going to be difficult. And, you know, you know, Jay, one of the things that we discussed on this, remember, we were had this whole discussion about Dvornikov, you know, and how he, the man from Chechnya was going to go in and save the day. Well, obviously not. That was several months ago. So again, it goes back to the notion of, of, you know, the Ukrainians now have, you know, drones where they can target people. Um, They have, you know, military weapons. The entire West is 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 there, and it, I, this is before the hard winter months, where the Germans will have to face some problems in terms of their their fuel and things like this. But you know, it's interesting what um, you know President Macron said today. Is you know he didn't mention this in a large way, but I caught it, and he said, you know, we're not uh, we're not as susceptible because we have nuclear power, and that was an interesting comment, giving all the problems. Um, that, you know, nuclear plants have had, including the most recent accident in Japan. But that is a solution. Um, It's not probably the best solution you want for any locale, but it is a solution to not depend on um, uh, Russian oil. And it's, you know, a fairly clean form of energy unless there's a meltdown and then you're in trouble. You know, like, and of course, we still have the nuclear reactors in Russia, which are always, I mean, in Ukraine, which are, you know, Zaporizhia, um, which is going to be, you know, uh, Another well, outcome, they, you know, right? they don't have to use bombs. Putin doesn't have to use bombs. All he has to do is sabotage that plant. And, Indeed. and then you have an attack on all of Western Europe. Uh, Indeed. It, yeah. And that's, well, that's, that's, that's not good. But, you know, it's, it's a, you know, we've been talking about this, you know, since February, Jay, and it's, it's very, in, um, it's very uh, uh, enlightening and, and heartening to see how far the Ukrainians have come. And it's, uh, you know, it's also another, you know, um, you know, another um, sort of large support internationally for democracy and the European countries coalescing together and supporting democracy. And I think, you know, to put this into a larger landscape, I mean, the, um, uh, you know, and I, I don't want to get into the political realm too much, but, you know, the, um, the unauthorized and unambiguously coup-like mentality in the United States of Donald Trump also is coming under a lot of fire right now. So I'm very optimistic about um, our future now because the Ukrainians are winning and um, Donald Trump is facing a lot of lawsuits. And I don't think you have to be a Republican or a Democrat or an independent to realize that, you know, our former president was involved with a lot of shady things. And yeah. um, so the overall concept of this, and of course, he was a friend of Putin. And so 
that gives you an, I mean, you know, if you're a friend of the North Korean president and you're a friend of Putin, where does that put you in terms of the world and also in terms of your position in history? Yeah, well, but uh, speaking of um, optimism, are you optimistic about um, Putin's uh, threats to use weapons, even if just tactical nuclear weapons? Because that could, that could be um, a, a dominoes, dominoes effect um, action. In other words, you start with one, even a little one. Before you know it, somebody else is thinking about what to do with nuclear weapons. And before you know it, you have a, a guns of August, World War I kind of dominoes effect. Um, well, how optimistic are you about that? Well, uh, you know, it, 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 it all depends on whether uh, Vladimir Putin is suicidal or not. Um, because if he launches nuclear weapons in any form um, that's possible, the United States is a very powerful country and it's a, it has a very powerful nuclear arsenal. And um, I think that the, you know, the reprisal on the part of the United States, and if, 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 if Vladimir Putin understands the state of his military, and the state of the United States is military. And um, this is what's nice about being the strongest um, military nation in the world. Um, although China is rapidly challenging that, but not completely. Um, then there's then there's real problems. And I think, you know, he would lose support, which he has lost somewhat already, support from China and also from India. And I think those are, you know, major checks on his um, use of, of nuclear arsenal. But you know, he, the the difficulty is that he talks about it, and you know, um, you know, uh, American diplomats, French diplomats, Chinese diplomats, Indian diplomats would never discuss this. So you know, you always have to give that ten percent chance of him actually carrying this out. I mean, I'm not, I'm not certain that he's willing to divorce himself from the entire world, because that'll mean no trade with India, no trade with China. If he launches this, then it's, it's really, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a new ball game. And the ball game, he's gonna lose heavily. I mean, in other words, you know, I mean, you know, normally what you do in a situation like this is you retaliate by focusing on the person who sent it, i.e. Moscow. So, um, and you know, where he's staying. And so, you know, in other words, that's not a scenario I think that he wants to face unless he is so ideologically um, um, inclined and he wants to um, commit suicide. That's the only, uh, so, I mean, you know, I don't think he's suicidal. I think he's smarter than that. Mm. You know, one scenario that, um, that, that interests me is that if he let go on a tactical nuclear weapon, um, it would change, in my view, the calculus. Um, and, and the first place it would change the calculus, even before a, a return strike by anybody, by anybody in, East, in Western Europe or, or the US, is his own people. And I can imagine the man or woman in the street uh, in Russia saying, what, now this, you know, conscription, uh, sanctions, our economy is in tatters. Um, he's affected, you know, our our food supply, our supply lines, our, all our, you know, retail you know, opportunities. Um, and now this, um, and I would, if I were in the street, I would, I would be encouraged to come after him. I, I would be encouraged to um, rise up. And the question is whether that would take place before a return strike uh, or the people who might otherwise do the return strike, whoever it is, um, would wait and see how the Russian people reacted um, and maybe play the propaganda game, you know, um, first. What do you think? I, you know, that's a possibility, Jay. I think it's a very thoughtful um, approach. I, I suspect knowing the American military and President Biden, that there would probably be immediate um, reaction. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I suspect, uh, I don't know, but I think it, that would be prudent. Um, I don't think you could wait uh, too long. I mean, I think that also, 
you know, for all the good that um, and all the really deliberate thoughtfulness of, of President Macron, um, America is really the person that, you know, um, is all, sometimes put in the position of cleaning up, you know, and, um, and taking action. But I think that, you know, uh, there might be a, a strategy that, you know, um, a, a, a pretty direct and um, a, a pretty direct hit on the Russian um, soil itself might solve a lot of the issues. Um, but, you know, best not to have that scenario. You know, it's, well, it's, it could be everybody let nuclear, go. Once we hit nuclear, it's, it's you know, it's, it's a no-win scenario for anybody being alive in, in the world today. And it's, it's tragic. Because, you know, one of the things that I always go back to is the 2014, I think it was 2014 agreements with the, in Minsk where the Ukrainians gave up their, your, their nuclear weapons in order to preserve a commitment by Russia never to invade. And That's very ironic, isn't it? It is. And, and I, I think that, you know, if um, the Ukraine just does join NATO, a solution to this never happening again is to put nuclear weapons to give the Ukrainians, you know, nuclear weapons so that this will not occur ever again. Um, because it's, you know, once someone is of a nuclear capability, the way France is, the way England is, um, the way Italy is, then you have a, you know, you have a choice about doing anything too aggressive because um, there are nuclear weapons there and um, they could be used in, in last resort. You know, I, unfortunately, you know, my wish is that a lot of nuclear weapons would be wiped off the face of the earth, but I don't, I don't, I don't think that's possible. And by the way, um, you know, there are articles written in foreign affairs about tactical nuclear weapons in the 60s. Um, you know, by um, one was written by Henry Kissinger. So, I mean, you know, I mean, it's not that far off, but, you know, luckily Kissinger and other people came to the realization that any kind of tactical nuclear weapons would lead to the destruction of the world and its resources. <laughs> well, what's the difference between a tactical weapon and a bigger weapon? <laughs> Once you start throwing them at each other, then, you know, you have the environment and it gets, it, and people die by the millions, and uh, right. it, it turns into uh, something out of Mad Max at Thunderdome. Um, but let me ask you this, though. Nothing happens in a vacuum. And the world stage now, Putin is on it. And Putin's announcement of his uh, 300,000 uh, sub conscripts, Putin's uh, threat, again, of, of nuclear weapons, it's felt around the world. And uh, I'm sure that any country that has supported him in the past is going to have a reaction. Even as recently as two weeks ago, uh, Xi, Xi Jinping in China said, yeah, I'm, I'm not so sure I want to support this guy. It sounds like he's a loose cannon or something. I, I'm, I'm going to change my, my support level for him. Um, and, I, and I think there's India, I think probably the same thing. Uh, Africa, a lot of the countries there, he, Putin has bought him off somehow. He's bribed them uh, to support him, even in uh, Latin America. But query, um, you know, if Macron says he's a, he's a, a pariah um, and he's got psychological issues, um, that's also on the world stage. Uh, if Biden criticizes him the way he did a couple of days ago, that's on the world stage. Uh, if this, this is all... Um, you know, in the context of the United Nations meeting going on in New York right now, um, or at least in recent days, um, query, how does the world feel about this? And, and assuming the world reacts as you and I would, uh, and as Xi Jinping has, um, query, how does that affect Putin? Does that change it for him? Well, I think that the United Nations today was very interesting because the Secretary Lavrov came in only for a couple minutes and there was no Russian representative hearing these speeches from the French ambassador, from, you know, from um, Secretary Blinken. Um, you know, so I don't think there's any question, um, even among the Indian, Indian leadership and the Chinese leadership, that uh, Vladimir Putin has, you know, really gone way too far. The question is how, how you resolve all of this. and. You know, the question came up, um, you know, to um, President Macron, you know, do you think that there could be negotiations now? And I'm, I'm not sure that 
uh, President Zelensky with them winning um, um, battles, you know, on Ukrainian territory that he would be too interested in in settling things at this point. Um, and, and, and well, not and perhaps he shouldn't because, you know, Russians still occupy Ukrainian territory. So I think that um, I don't see a win here for Russia. I don't see a long term win. Um, I, I don't see I think more territory is going to be um, absorbed back into Ukraine. Uh, there may be short term victories for Russia. But, you know, I mean, not only when you invade, do you have to be able to win battles, but you have to be able to hold on to the to the territory. And, that, you know, that's a huge expenditure. And so, you know, I just you know, it was it was a silly notion to invade to begin with. Silly from a, just a, a purely pragmatic point of view. We're not going to talk about the morality and the ethics of doing this because that was, you know, horrendous and killing people for more territory. And as as I mentioned earlier, Macron called it a colonial venture. And I think that's not a bad term. I mean, or maybe a neo-colonial venture, you know, trying to reformulate the Soviet Union. But I just, you know, I I it just it was just incredible. And Jay, I'm rereading War and Peace right now. And you know, Tolstoy has sort of a dim view of warfare and what goes on during warfare and you know, what goes on in the, in the greater Russian society while it's happening. It's, you know, it's, it's not a repeat of history, but it's sort of like, haven't we learned, you know, and hasn't, hasn't, um, hasn't Putin learned? And I, you know, I think, you know, this is really, in some way you can think of this as sort of the last grasp of Soviet man, you know, like he's trying to preserve what, what was the night was a 20th century version of the Soviet Union. And it's, it's, um, it's just crazy, but I want to I want to talk a little bit about um, your allusion to Tom Snyder, if if you don't mind. Is that okay, Jay? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, Tom Snyder, and this is true, and I hate to category a lot of people because the right does this, and I, I don't think it's necessarily always true, but I think it's somewhat true. And I think when you have left leaning or even farther left professors talking about um, nation states, uh, they often don't discuss what nation states were replacing. And of course, in modern Europe, you had, you know, the uh, Christianity and the Catholic Church. And that's what held people together um, in the Middle Ages, you know, if, if you would call it holding it together. And with the nation state, you also have to have allegiance primarily to your country, not to the king or queen. And so, you know, when you lose divine, mar divine right monarchy, as in with the English revolutions and things like that, you begin to get statehood. And of course, the early Russian and Ukrainian version of this was, you know, very driven by um, Kievan princes and things like that. And then, you know, after they moved northward, they went to um, Tsars. But I would maintain that you really didn't have a Russian state until, um, in, in the true sense of the word, until after 1861, when, the, when you have the emancipation of the serfs. So... You know, I think Tom Snyder, what interest, what's interesting about um, Professor Snyder, and I give him a lot of credit for this, is to challenge his Yale students to think of the nation state as not the end at all, because it was a historically formulated drive. And just like, you know, Joseph Campbell talks about foundation myths across countries, um, I think Professor Snyder is doing a wonderful job with his students and asking the right types of questions. And just as an aside, Jay, when I was uh, watching that wonder, splendid video that you sent to me, um, number two in his series, um, he was lamenting the fact that, that someone had their cell phone hidden under their notes and stuff. You may remember that, that slight mention. And, you know, when I was going to graduate school, there was a Renaissance historian named Stephen Greenblatt, who's you know, had a joint position at Princeton and, and Berkeley. And you still couldn't see him in the New York Review of Books. And He's really an expert on the Renaissance. And I remember him lambasting a student who was um, having the Daily California. This is, of course, at Berkeley and uh, reading it while he was lecturing and stopping his lecture and telling the student to put it away. So, but I, you know, I kind of lament the days when professors had to tell people to stop reading as opposed to fooling around <laughs> with their body cell phones. So, Carl, I, I want to be, uh, I want to be helpful here. The, the fact is that, uh, Tim Snyder, who's written a couple of books about tyranny and others, other things. Um, uh, he, he does put his lecture about Ukraine on, on, uh, on YouTube. Um, I think it's right next to ours, you know, 
And uh, every every class uh, he he videotapes and he puts it on YouTube. So um, that's you know that this is good and and we're going to put this on YouTube and uh, <laughs> we'll see what the students have to say. <laughs> Carl Ackerman, um, a PhD in European history, uh, helping us understand uh, what's going on with Putin and Russia and Ukraine. It's an ongoing question. It's um, as uh, what's his name. Uh, Tim Snyder said, if there's one word, one concept um, that defines history, it's the word change. Change versus continuity. <laughs> I would agree with that. Thank you, Carl. Thank you so much for coming around. Really appreciate it. We'll talk to you Thank soon. You. Thank you, Jay, and and you 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 get that menshood, uh, um, uh, knighted menshood, um, uh, by by everyone in the world and everyone watching this. Because you are a true mensch, Jay Fidel. <laughs> Thank you, Carl Ackerman. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.